Hi guys and welcome to episode 5 of the Northern Rugby Podcast. Today we're joined by ex-Wasps, Connacht, Newcastle Falcons and Leinster man Mike McCarthy. So Mike was also an Ireland international but had to unfortunately retire in 2017 before he got the chance to finish off his career in France due to injury. Since then Mike has been working for the RPA where he helps players build for their own futures after their rugby careers are over. We chat through Mike's entire rugby career including working under Warren Gatland at Wasps Two spells in Galway with Connacht, having to crash Dave Walder's house when he signed for Newcastle Falcons, and the very successful spell with Leinster at the back end of his career. Mike has played with some of the very best players of his generation through his 17 years in rugby, so it's a very insightful chat with some interesting stories. So let's get right into it and see what Mike had to say. Hi, Mike, can you hear us? Lads, I'm back. There we go. How are you doing, guys? I yeah, assume thanks. you're a pleased man after uh, the weekend results. Yeah, mate. I managed to. I didn't have the Premier Premier Sports Channel, so I managed to get around to me uh, father-in-law's, and um, I remember I downloaded it on his uh, TV ages ago. So uh, yeah, I managed to watch it. So no, it was good. It was good. Uh, you, you you'll be disappointed, obviously, but uh, they go again. <laughs> they go again against Toulouse now this next week, don't they? Yeah. This week now. I was saying to people before a bit disappointed, but. I, I didn't really have any expectations of, of beating that Leinster team. They're just too they're just too good. Yeah, I thought they might have had a chance because they they put in a very good performance last year in the quarter final, didn't they, at the Aviva, yeah. um, and actually nearly nearly beat them. And they started so well um, on Saturday, didn't they? Uh, yeah. Hume scored after a couple of minutes. That's a wonder try. Yeah, it was a good try. But yeah. then, uh, yeah, kind of uh, not much happened after that. Um, yeah, there's quite a few. There's there's about seven. Leinster lads, uh, ex Leinster lads from Dublin who are on the bench um, playing for Ulster. So I'm sure they were, uh, yeah, they they looked pretty good afterwards. Have you been chatting to the uh, the Leinster lads? What you know, what are their thoughts on, on winning the league this year? On well, I haven't spoken to any of them since they won it. I uh, messaged a few of them before it, wish them luck. But uh, um, yeah, no, I'm sure they're uh, well. They're, they're, the next, they're looking at the drive for five next, so they're trying to get that fifth star on the jersey. Um, playing, obviously, playing Saracens at the weekend, um, who and they haven't lost a game since they lost to Saracens in the Champions Cup final in Newcastle, as you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they they'll be very excited about that. They came up short uh, in Newcastle, but um, I'm sure they've taken lots of learnings. And uh, obviously, Farrell's not playing, is he? So that's a big loss for a big loss for Saracens. So what is it? Is it 17, 17 league wins in a row for Leinster? I think it's seventeen Five in a row. Yeah, days before they since they last got beat. Do you think yeah, that's just cool. a, a? Do you think I mean because they've barely got out of second gear in the league this year? Do you think it's uh, partly? I mean, obviously the strength and depth is absolutely ridiculous at Leinster at the minute. Um, but would you like to see them sort of? Would you like to see the Pro 14 a little bit more competitive? Um, it seems to have just been dominated by Leinster in the last couple of years. Do you think it would be sort of good to see a couple of the other sides maybe push for it a little bit more instead of that focus on Europe? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you can see by the number of players Leinster have used the season. They've used 53 players in the season. They've got an unbelievable squad. They're picking from, you know, they've got a big pool of players in, in Dublin and a great um, school system, academy system. So the young guys coming through are absolutely ridiculous. It's, a, it's kind of a conveyor belt um, of talent coming through. Um, and then, yeah, they've clearly got uh, fantastic coaches. Stuart Lancaster's got, gone there, who's made a, had a huge impact yeah. for the lads. But um, yeah, no, there's um, the, 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 there's always tight games in the Pro 14. And, you know, I think I think it is pretty, pretty competitive, but obviously Leinster are kind of just head and, head, head and tails above the rest of them. Um, yeah, with with that, I mean, in my opinion, Leinster are the the best side in Europe, uh, and I think we'll probably see it with a, another Heineken Cup win. But I would absolutely love to see Leinster against you know a Crusaders, but with both sides, um, you know, with a sort of a, an aligned calendar, so both sides can you know properly uh, have a go at it. That would just be, I mean, that's pay per view stuff. That. Yeah, no, be obviously, yeah, that'll be interesting to see. Um, did you see? Did you see what they were doing in pre in during lockdown? Though they were the Leinster were analysing the Crusaders, and Crusaders were analysing Leinster as if they were going to play each other. So, oh, right, okay. I mean, you talk about um, innovation and trying to find those one or two percenters to 
kind of make you a better side. And um, I suppose that's kind of where Leinster are at. You know, that seems like a pretty uh, clever exercise to do. So oh, definitely, yeah. I'm sure during lockdown they've been getting ahead in terms of you know getting fed back um, from Crusaders. You know what what they would view their weaknesses as. Are, yeah, you know, looking at footage of them, so uh, I'm sure that's you know, in the close of the season coming up now, that will have been hugely helpful for them. Yeah, definitely. Well, Mike, thanks very much for uh, for coming on the podcast. It's good to have you here. Um, what we typically do with the, the guys that come on is we just have a, a look back through the career, um, from the start to finish, and talk through all the all the highs and the lows. So. If you don't mind, let's head back to the start, your early days with Wasps. Just just talk us through how you got started and those uh you know those those first couple of seasons if you can remember. Lads, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. It's an honour to be on. Um, you've had you've, you've had you had Berkey and Jamie Noon on already, haven't you? Yeah, Jamie was on uh, last week and he was uh, he was good crack. He told us some good stories. I oh, did, he? did he? Okay. Uh, well, lads, I'll try and remember back. It's it's it's. It's been a long while ago, but um, yeah, no, Wasps, I, I came out of school, uh, joined Wasps in 2000, and I wasn't actually on a contract my first year. I'd gone to a trial after school and managed to scrape in. I was a bit fat and overweight back then, uh, <laughs> clocking in about 20 stones, so I was a bit of a ruck inspector. Um, used to get to the, the rucks just as the scrum half was passing the ball away. So uh, yeah, I had uh, Nigel Melville my first year, and... Um, I had uh, then I had two years with Warren, Warren Gatland and um, Sean Edwards, so they were two unbelievable. Co- I, I, every every coach I've had along my career, I've I've been very lucky. Wasps, Connacht, Falcons, uh, Leinster, and Ireland to have you know some great great coaches. So I had Warren, and I was going for second row then, but Warren thought I was a thought I was a six, so I played. I started playing six, and um, yeah, it was. Uh, it was, it was. I was a bit of a rabbit in the headlights to begin with, because you know you had. I was back row. I had the likes of Delalio, Joe Worsley, Paul Volley, Simon Shaw there. Trevor Leota was there, so <laughs> I was pretty scared going to whenever there was any contact training, uh, knowing Trevor was there. But um, oh, I, was at, I was at Bruno University my first year there, so yeah, no, it was it was great. I really enjoyed it, and uh, I didn't play many games. I think I only played six. It was under ten games, um, but managed to get out of there with. Uh, uh, as a Premiership medal and a European Challenge Cup medal, even though I didn't play in the, the final, <laughs> so I was, I was pretty, I was pretty happy, happy. Yeah, and I, I suppose you mentioned that the competition you're up against did that kind of drive your decision then to uh, to go to Cork? Yeah, I just kind of felt at the time that um, if I'm if I'm being honest, like G- Gats wanted me to stay, but I was getting. I was getting offered more uh, financially to go to Connor. I know it's not all about the money, but um, that was one of the reasons is the strength and depth they had in the back row. Uh, I, as I said, I've been there three years. I was still a young fella. And, you know, sometimes I look back and think maybe, oh, sh- perhaps you should have just backed yourself and gone for it. But anyway, I left because, yeah, I saw the likes of Delalio, Worsley, Volley, who were going to be there for a long time. And I, I felt I needed to be playing more first team action, getting more experience. Because uh, I think I'd seen, you know, guys who kind of sat it out and got left behind and didn't play much rugby you can kind of um, can go a bit stagnant for you. So I just felt I needed to be playing and um, and, and and to get away. And actually, uh, actually, uh, Leinster tried to get me then, but I, I decided to go to Connacht again because I just thought I'd play more rugby as a young fella. Okay. And. Uh... Pete's never been to, to Galway, so just, just tell him what Galway's like. Darren, I went I went on a stag do last year. So oh, I know. you did? That's right, you did. <laughs> I know what the uh, the bars are like. It's drink over there. It's a great part of the world. Um, and th- what I did notice is they were, it was sport mad, just completely sport mad. Um, you know, like the, the whole place, the sort of Gaelic like football and, and Connaught. Uh, it's so big over there. Um, so, so what was that sort of like living over there in Galway? Where yeah, well, it? yeah, no, it was amazing. I didn't really know. My grandparents are from that part of Ireland, um, but I, yeah, I'd not been to Galway, and um, yeah, when, my first year there, it was, as you said, the rugby's competing with um, the the hurling, the Gaelic football, and other sports. So it was my my first season. It was literally one man and his dog watching the games. Um, 
as, as you know, what the, the the sports ground's like. It's got a dog track around it. Uh, you've got the Atlantic coast, the wind blowing in. So uh, a lot of the games there is a lot of wind and a lot of rain. Um, but Galway as a place is fantastic. It's a it's a, it's a small little city, but as you as you know, there's um, there's there's this little street called Shop Street, and um, yeah, so you'd assume there's a load of shops down there, but it's kind of the main shopping area in Gal- in Galway City. But it's literally pub, bar, shop, restaurant, pub, bar, shop. There's more pubs <laughs> and bars than there are, sh- there are shops. So yeah, and a uh, popular place to go for kind of Hindus and stags, and they've got the Galway Oyster Festival and yeah. Galway Ra- Galway Races is a big one. Um, Galway Races is a big one. They say they say if you don't need um, if you don't need uh, like a handyman, like a plumber or something, um, you won't get one for a week before or a week after the Galway races because the the whole place literally comes to a standstill for three weeks. Um, <laughs> but it's 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 quite funny because when when I started at Connet, we used to we'd be in for pre season and then uh, at the end of a block of pre season, you'd get um, you'd, you'd have the Galway races to look forward to. So we'd have the whole week off and we'd literally lads would go and absolutely lose the plot for five six days on the drink at the Galway races and then they obviously come come back and they would have undone all the good work they've done during pre-season so now it gradually started getting oh you can have you get two days off or three days I think I think they just get two days off now so they don't get the full they don't get the full week off because lads are coming back in an absolute state <laughs> so. and uh your your first spell at Connacht didn't last long you're only there for the season um so so how did the move to Falcons come around uh, to be honest, it was just completely out of the blue. Um, as I said, I moved to Connacht really to get game time and I had that connection with my grandparents being Irish and um, absolutely loved my time at Connacht. And, um, you know, you just I, I played a lot of rugby that season and um, I didn't, hadn't realised I was on Newcastle's radar at all. Um, but, you know, I had, a, I had a bit of interest from a few clubs back in the Premiership and, um, yeah, just it was completely out of the blue. Um Rob Andrew uh, had, had scouted me and um, yeah, ended up coming to sign in for Falcons for three years. I, I, I don't know if I'd even never been to Newcastle um, before, and um, yeah, I, I just yeah, I so I moved to Newcastle and um, yeah, had an amazing three years. Absolutely loved it. I suppose you'd call me an adopted Geordie now. My mum certainly is. She. I, I, I hadn't really seen her when I was kind of since I left school. So I said to mum, look, I'm I'm moving to Newcastle. I signed for three years. Why didn't you move up to Newcastle? And she's been here ever since uh, I signed there. Um, and I absolutely loves it. So uh, and I absolutely love it. So uh, it's it's nice. Nice to be nice to be back here. And uh, it's, it's my home now. And uh, you made a, a try scoring debut. Can you remember it at all? Yeah, I can because uh, it's me. And, so when I moved, I I didn't have any accommodation sorted. So I and I was living with Dave Walder uh, and Phil Dowson for for um, well, I think I told Dave it would be only two weeks. End up being about I think six to nine months. Um, <laughs> but no, no, that was a really happy memory living with those two. There, I, I went to school with Dowson, so I, I know him really well. We're really good mates, and um, yeah, it was great living with Dave. So uh, he was really good take, taking me in. Um, I'm sorry, I've actually forgotten the question. Now you asked me, but uh, yeah, what did you ask me? It was the uh, your, your try scoring debut. Oh, what sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah. See, I waffle on a bit, and I forget what you actually asked me. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I scored. I scored two and two. My first two games. I think we played Worcester or Bath away. A uh, Worcester away first game of the season. Um, and I, I, to be honest, I wasn't really. I, when the team was read out, I didn't think I'd be starting. To be honest, because. Um, you know, they had some amazing back rowers there. Uh, as you know, Simo Satiti, I think, was there. I can't remember if they were there when I started, but, you know, Charvis, Owen Finnegan. Um, so, yeah, to get the call to be starting was great. And, uh, yeah, it was a sunny day down at Worcester. And, yeah, I scored, uh, I scored a try and I scored the week after against, I think it was the week after, away to Bath. Um, so, got off to a good start anyway. Yeah, and um, Pete's obviously being the um, Falcons fan. I remember more about that season than I do. Yeah, I mean, we had a, we, as you said, we had a great back row then as well, with yourself included. But like the likes of uh, Satiti was a brilliant player. Um, Owen Finnegan was probably a little bit disappointing, you know, with him being a World Cup winner coming over. I think from, certainly from a sort of fan's point of view, you know, we, we were used to sort of Matt Burke 
um, come over. Yeah. I, I, I just felt Owen Finney was probably possibly just over the hill slightly when he came, but it was still it was it was a great player to bring along. Um, it yeah. certainly sort of got the fans interested, you know, and you've got a World Cup winner of that calibre. Um, must have been brilliant, but even for yourself as a young lad, and I know you can sort of look after yourself quite nicely, but when you're in a back row with Samuel Sotiti and uh, Owen Finnegan, you, you're pretty well looked after it <laughs> if, you, if you get into any, any problems. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, because I said, I, the reason I moved to Connor was to kind of play more rugby and kind of, you know, maybe I sh- possibly looking back, should I say, at Wasp and just back myself. And that's kind of one of the reasons I went to Newcastle. I saw the squad they had and the team they had and the players they had. And I was kind of, you know, doubt myself a bit thinking, gee, well, you know, am I going to go over there and not play any rugby? And I said, look, just back yourself and go for it. And, you know, it worked out because my first two years, I literally, I think I played pretty much, well, I played most of the games in my first two seasons. And, um, you know, there's other great back rows, as well. Ben Woods and uh, Corey Harris were two uh, quality players. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, no, it was just, uh, it was, it was just really, really enjoyable, those, those first two seasons for me at Newcastle. Yeah, I mean, we we spoke with Matt Burke um, a couple of episodes ago, and you know that sort of squad was brilliant. As you've mentioned, all those forwards and the backs were brilliant as well. We had the likes of sort of Wilkinson. You had the young lads of Flood and Tate coming through. Um, Tom May, uh, obviously Berkey and Dave Walder, and every, it was such a brilliant squad. And um, I think you were part of the we part of the Heineken Cup run in the in, in your first year. We got to the quarter final against Stade Francais. In Paris, we were quite well beaten then, but um, yeah, I mean that that was certainly, I mean, one of the best seasons that I've watched us have. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I do remember it. Was it what was that? What year was that? Two thousand and two thousand five. Yeah, yeah, two thousand five. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, no, that was at that stage the biggest game I I played in. You know, I think fifty thousand. It was Parc de Prince and. Um, uh, yeah, we just got. I mean, it was it was good. Obviously, good to get to the quarter final. But uh, we, yeah, we were we got our pants pulled down a bit in that quarter final, <laughs> um, to say the least. Um, but I, I remember we we had, I was kind of when I knew I was coming on the podcast, I kind of had a bit of a think, and I just remembered we kept we went into the game with this tactic because you know even now playing the French sides, you know what are they good at? They've got a very strong. Uh, they're always strong up front, scrum. And Maul and Stade Francais, they were a star-studded team. They had a really good Maul that was kind of killing sides each week with it, with this Maul. And uh, we we came into the game with this tactic. You know, the tactic with a Maul where you you kind of uh, you withdraw from the when it yeah, forms. You, yeah. don't, you don't you don't you don't engage it. Uh, you kind of hold off, and you know they get penalised if they pass the ball to the back because it's offside. Um, so we went in with that tactic and, you know, we thought it was going to be a great tactic and it just, Alan Roland was, it, it was kind of a new tactical rule at that time. And Alan Roland was just having absolutely none of it, um, whatsoever. <laughs> um, even though I think our coaches had spoken to him, but, but anyway, yeah. So that obviously didn't help. And yeah, the wheels uh, fell off a bit, but, uh, you know, it was, it was disappointing, but, um, you know, something to build on, I suppose, getting to the quarter final. Yeah, definitely. So, so what what was sort of the reasoning behind leaving the Falcons and going back to Connaught? Um, I mean, at that sort of time, Connaught were starting to evolve into uh, into a much much more competitive side. Was it sort of was it to play a bit more? Was it just because you missed the pubs and bars and the Galway races? <laughs> <laughs> that obviously helped, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no. The, the the honest reason is, so I said to you, my, I signed for three years. My first two years were absolutely amazing, like played every game, uh, pretty much every game. And uh, my third season, so Rob Andrew left and got the England job after my second season and new coaches came in and it happens to every player during their career. It's all part of the journey, I suppose. Um, you know, I just completely lost favour. I think there was about six or seven of us that um, lost favour. So I, I I didn't help myself either, I don't think, because I think I played a game against Saracens. I got simbinned. Um, but yeah, started off being on the bench. That's third season, and then I wasn't even getting on the, in the match squad. So um, look, that's that's down to me. Obviously, wasn't playing well enough in that third year, and um, you know had opportunities to go elsewhere and wanted to be playing. And uh, you know, been to Connor, had a great time there, and you know, so it was an easy decision to uh, to go back. And uh, yeah, so but you know, I look back on my time with Newcastle with real happy memories and. Um, 
you know, I've I've always followed them ever since, and um, you know, it's great to see them finish fourth a few seasons ago. And um, you know, as I say, I'm now an adopted Geordie. I'm back living here uh, since I retired two, three years ago. Three years ago, I've uh, been back here for two years, so um, absolutely loving it. So, Mike, you go back to um, to Connacht, and uh, at, at what point are you starting to think about the Ireland squad? When when does that come into your mind? Um, well, I, I obviously knew I was qualified through my grandparents, and um, so I went back to Connor, and yeah, I was I was regularly I was playing week in week out. Um, there was kind of no rotation or resting. I mean, we didn't have the squad to do that back then, so you know I was playing week in week out, and um, I was playing well, um, and I was, you know, I thought. I, you know that was the target was to play for Ireland, and um, it took a long time, mind, because I had the likes of Donnacha O'Callaghan and Paul O'Connell and um, like Nick O'Driscoll there, Leo Cullen. So I had a, a lot of quality players um, who were already in the setup. Yeah, and um, you know back then playing for Connor, it's not the same now, but you know kind of getting picked to play for Ireland when you're playing for Connor, it was you know it was a lot more difficult to get into to those initial squads. So, you know, I didn't, I was, I didn't, I don't know, for my first few years, I wasn't really getting in, the, in any of the training squads. And I suppose I, I actually thought I got to a stage where I thought the ship had sailed. Um, Declan Kidney's a, you know, he's a, from Munster. So like, um, yeah, I didn't think uh, he, he was too interested in me, but, you know, I kept on plodding away, kept on working hard, kept on playing well. And, uh, you know, eventually it took me till 29, but, um, Eventually, uh, better late than never, I managed to managed to get capped. Um, so, as I said, I thought the ship had sailed, but you know, eventually, I got, eventually, I got there. And um, um, so, yeah, that was a, a, obviously a big highlight. Was yeah. there any sort of talk? Because obviously, you'd been at the Falcons with Rob Andrew. Was there any talk with Rob about uh, about England, maybe, or, or was it just sort of solely, you know, after you left the Falcons, was it just just Ireland that were interested, or, or were England at any point? Speaking no, to you about anything? No, I, I, I had had, I had. Robert told me that um, not not when I first started. I know Andy Robinson was interested. Like you said, I started the first season pretty well and had a had a good season. And I know I was kind of well. I don't think I was close, but I think I was. You know, I was. Uh, I was on. The, I was kind of on the radar ish. Um, but yeah, no. After those first two years. Um, no, there's nothing from England at that point. And um, Pete had mentioned before about Connor kind of becoming a more well-rounded team, a team that could um, compete a little bit better kind of towards uh, the end of the noughties. And there was one game in particular I remember. I was in uni when I watched this, and it was um, Connor against Toulon in the Challenge Cup semi-final. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if you can remember the game at all, but... I was desperate for uh, Connacht to win and get through to the uh, to the Challenge Cup final. Uh, do you remember that at all? Yeah, no, it was amazing. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a uh, Toulon were lucky, I suppose, because a lot of teams that come to the sports ground, as I said, uh, they're greeted with um, wind and rain, um, and it was a bright, sunny, hot day, no wind, uh, kind of conditions you expect back in Toulon, probably. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, I think um, yeah, it was great for us to get in the quarterfinal and I was probably the occasion just got to us a bit. Uh, I, I also said when I was there my first year, it was literally one man and his dog there. So it was to have, I think it was between eight and 10,000 crammed into the sports ground. You know, they put temporary stands in and it was like a, it was like a little cauldron. It was, uh, the atmosphere was absolutely amazing. And I, can, I can't remember the game exactly. I mean, I just remember all their big superstars and... Um, it was it was it was fast. We had to do a lot of defending, and I think we were in in the game there or thereabouts. But I suppose when you have to do so much defending, eventually, you know, it just saps you of energy. And yeah. I think that's kind of how I kind of do remember it. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I, can't, I think we I don't think we lost by much. I think it was maybe just one score. Um, yeah, it was. Um, it was nineteen twelve. So, Your old mate Johnny Wilson kind of kicked you to death. Yeah, that, yeah, and it was, it was this Sonny Bill Williams scored, I think it was off a scrum, he hit a line yeah. and scored under the posts. Um, 
So yeah, that was yeah. No, a shame we didn't make it any further, but uh, it was it was uh, it was a good day. Um, but one of the happier memories at Connacht was uh, actually because when you play your old club, um, it's always big emotionally for you as an individual. But we played Falcons in two thousand seven, I think, just after I'd left, um, and that we, we, you know, Falcons came to the sports ground. They, you know, the names you said before: the Tates, Floody, Nooney. Uh, Tommy May, Floody, Johnny Wilson, Heyman, uh, who else? Jeff Park, you know, Tim Visser. So there was star-studded side, and uh, you know, at Connacht we weren't a star-studded side. We had a lot of guys that worked incredibly hard. Um, but you know, that was a great win for us that that day at the Sports Ground. We 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 beat Newcastle there uh, pretty well that day. So I I, I certainly enjoy that day because when you leave, <laughs> you know, you know, when you leave a club and go to another club, it's always. Always a big game for you. You've got people out to get you at rock time, and oh, exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So playing against your mates and stuff. So, yeah. Um... And then um, Leinster come calling again, and this time you make the move. So, so how did that move come around? Yeah, that that yeah. So um, that 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 was actually nearly happened uh, two years before. So the year Sean Cronin and Sean Carr left to join Leinster, I'd. I'd actually verbally agreed to join Leinster. I'd been I'd been down to Dublin. I'd met with Joe Schmidt, John O'Gibbs, and uh, Guy Easterby, and um, you know I was pretty much dead set that I, I was going. And went back to Connor, and you know I loved my time at Connor, and really did enjoy it. And kind of uh, I, I got basically got talked into staying for another two years at Connor. Um, a lot of the senior players called me into the office, and we had a. a, a had a meeting, I had a meeting with the coach, meetings with the coaches and ended up staying. And, you know, that's always something in my head I look back on. And, you know, I, I, I as I said, I absolutely love my time at Connacht. Um, so many happy memories. Galway's such a special place. And, um, you know, that's one of the questions in my head is, did, you know, sh- you know, sh- I think if I'd gone, I might have regret- thought to myself, should have I stayed at Connacht? And, you know, I stayed at Connacht, and I think, should have I left? Should I have left a little bit earlier? Because, you know, the year, that year they, they won the Champions Cup. So, um, beating Ulster in the final, I think it was. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, but so I stayed at Connacht. And um, then eventually, after another two years later, I, I, I signed for Leinster for three years. Um, so, yeah, that was the start and- of that. What, what's it like? Because um, obviously with the Falcons and Connacht, it's it's two sides that are trying to punch up the table, but they're not necessarily used to, uh, you know, competing for trophies and competing for titles. And then you move to Leinster, where success is almost kind of demanded by the uh, you know by the team and the fans. So is that a difficult adjustment to make? Uh, I was aware of it going in. You know, there's there's different, diff, you know, different uh, kind of cultural or belief. Um, at that stage, and that's not saying because Connaught's Connaught would be at that that point now, and you know it's great to see them win the Pro Fourteen uh, a few years back. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, but at the, at that point in time when I did leave, yeah, it was just a a, a big difference in terms of kind of pro- professionalism and the way they trained, the nutrition. Um, you know, get you know, have you heard of these Dexter scans? You know, for body fat, well, it's not done with the calipers. You know, all these little things. Yeah. Um, you know the 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 facilities uh it was um yeah success was demanded and um uh yeah it was it was a big a big change to what i'd uh, been used to and uh you had a, a great first season pro 14 title in Dubai. How, how did that feel yeah that was amazing yeah um it was it was uh yeah so i played all that season and Actually, coming into the final, I got a calf injury. So I was out for, I think I was out for about four to six weeks. So I was thinking, ah, oh, typical. Uh, we get to, we're going to get to the final. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to play in this final, um, even though I've played all the games during the season. So I was pretty gutted. Um, but the SNC and rehab and medical staff there are absolutely amazing. And I managed to get back ahead of schedule. Um, so I was slightly concerned because I hadn't played much rugby so I wasn't going to be match fit but you know I was they started me for the final and uh you know man, managed managed to get through it um but yeah that was again a, a real hot sunny day um played at the RDS um in front of our home support and yeah just a, a great day and it kind of goes by so quickly um but yeah nice to get a bit of silverware and um 
yeah, a great a great day. I'll, I'll, I remember well. And that was, uh, if I remember right, was that Brian O'Driscoll's final season as well? Yeah, that was yeah, that was Draco's last last season. Um, all the crowds were chanting one one more year, one more year, the whole <laughs> game. Um, so yeah, no, it's yeah, like when I look back, I'm you know because I look back and I think some of the players I played with is you know I th- I never thought I'd be a professional rugby player when I was kind of. 17, 18, and then, you know, like, you know, the guy, you know, Johnny Johnny Wilkinson at Newcastle, like, all the big names at Newcastle I played with, um, Lens of, you know, the amazing players and Wasps and Connor. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of looked back with such happy memories of uh, my, my all, all the clubs I've played at, really. Yeah, it'll certainly be an interesting uh, Ultimate 15 when we get onto that at the end. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, right. I've got to. Do, I haven't thought about this. Do I have to oh. take it straight away? <laughs> it's all right. Whoever comes to mind first is probably the right but, answer. But lads, sorry. Just can I just say, just just going back to professionalism though. You were asking me mm-hmm. about you know the change going to Leinster, but I, you know I kind of I had seen that before because when I left Connor and came to Newcastle, signed for three years, I remember distinctly. You know when you drive into Newcastle Falcons ground, so. Normally the forwards would be in a bit earlier to to do uh, I don't know a line out review preview or uh, just to have a just to do some line outs or you know so, or they might be in the gym earlier so normally the forwards are always in earlier so I remember driving into Falcons car park and literally every morning no matter what time it was I drove in I could see through you know you can see through onto the pitch through the metal bars yeah I'm a, jo- Johnny would always be be there kicking practicing yeah. his kicking and I was just like. That's what professionalism is. Um, and uh, again, when I first joined Newcastle, we, we we actually went on a pre-season tour to to Ireland, and we played Munster and Connacht in pre-season. And we we're staying at staying at the uh, U University of Limerick, UL. Um, so we so we went outside to try, we had a morning session and an afternoon session. The morning it was absolutely lashing down with rain. We went out, we trained. Um, everyone's you know, cold and wet, and then you get a break to go back into the the college to have your lunch and a bit of a break before the afternoon session. And I remember Johnny stayed outside and was doing kicking while we but went back in for lunch. And I think his brother Sparks brought him out kind of uh, sandwiches or something. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was just kind of gave me a great insight into you know I suppose what it takes and yeah. you know how how badly do you want it? Yeah, because I, I mean it certainly wasn't. The most, I mean, obviously, talent wise, he was exceptional, but he wasn't, you know, like the, one of the best naturally talented rugby players. He just put the work in, uh, and he's he's a prime example of, you know, working hard and being rewarded for it. Um, just the true model professional. Uh, so, very lucky to have him up at Newcastle. Yeah, yeah, he's, well, he's an absolute legend, isn't he? So, and I don't think many fly halves hit as hard as Johnny as well. Um, so that was something that he always kind of had above uh, anyone else who played in his position. I yeah, think. But legally hit, uh, legally hit anyone. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, true. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Owen Farrell's in a bit of trouble at the minute, but yeah. uh, and we, Darren and I would just say what a what a shame it is to see Farrell miss out on having that Sexton Farrell duel again um, on you know this weekend coming because I mean that, you you just want to see the best players play against each other, so it's uh, it's a big shame to see him miss out. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's a big, big loss, big loss. So, um, and then I think Saris have lost a few. I mean, they've still got an amazing squad, but from that final last year, I think there's a few have gone, haven't they? Is it is Cruz still there? And I think Skelt will. I remember Will, uh, big Will Skelton, um, was tearing tearing it up at yeah, uh, definitely that day. So, um, Mike, just a quick one. Obviously, you mentioned earlier when you were at um, when you were at Connacht, there was no real kind of squad depth or rotation so you, you kind of knew in your own mind that you would play every day when you then move to Leinster and you start to see these young guys come through the likes of um, you know like Jack Conan uh, Dan Levy Van der Fleer and all these kind of guys coming through in the back row does that kind of drive you on or does, does it kind of make you panic a bit and think shit these guys look amazing and you know, are they coming through to take my place yeah well so I was used to playing a corner week in week out 80 minutes even if I was, uh, even if I could only walk or jog around the place because I was cramping up. There's times I was cramping up, and you know I wouldn't get taken off. So it was, uh, 
Yeah, so I went to Len- when I went to Leinster, you know, I was I was getting taken off after 50, 60 minutes, and I I remember at the start I was thinking, what, what, do I, why the hell are they taking me off? Like, do they think I've had a bad game? And I was thinking I'd had a good game, and then I, I slowly realised that they weren't. They just, you know, they they just use they use the bench, they use the subs. Uh, they, you know, you get rotated, you play X amount of games, and then you get you get a rest, um, and that's just the the way they work. They really do utilise the squad. Uh, I think it brings brings the best out on everyone. But yeah, that, I mentioned before the conveyor belt of players coming through, it's crazy. And uh, yeah, you're well well aware of it. And you know, you know, you can't you can't let up in terms of you know maybe perhaps at times in my career I was in the comfort zone, knowing you know I, I'd probably start the next week if I hadn't had a had a great game. Where I definitely knew that wasn't the case at Leinster. There was. You know, there's people my age, there's people older than me, there's people, young guys coming out of school who are absolutely um, in flying form. So if you weren't performing week in, week out, you were you, you definitely um, weren't in the squad, no matter who you were. Yeah, and uh, I just wanted to talk briefly about a game. Like, I'm, I'm sure you won't really have fond memories of this game, but it, it's one of the best games that I can remember. It was the... Uh, Hannigan Cup semi-final against Toulon in 2015. Oh, the one that went to extra time. Extra time, yep. Yeah. It's, it's one of the best games I've ever seen. Um, yeah. And obviously, as, as, as an Irishman, I was desperate for Leinster to go through. But uh, what can you kind of remember about that game? Yeah, well, I remember there's in my career, there's been two times when I've cried. And uh, that was that was one of them. Um, the first, yeah, the, the, the other one was 2013 when we were beating the All Blacks at the Aviva Stadium. Um, and they they kept the ball for four and a half minutes. Yeah. Uh, Jack, Jack, Jack McGrath got penalised coming off his feet when we were trying to just um, wind the clock down. We were in the lead, um, and he got yeah a penalty for coming off uh, someone coming off their feet, and they kept the ball for four and a half minutes, scored in the corner, and won the game. So yeah. I cried after that I one. I that as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, cried after that one, and then unfortunately, uh, you know, desperately wanted to win a Champions Cup and. We, uh, you know, we're playing the Toulon, the best, you know, probably the best, one of the best European ty- teams ever. I mean, that that star-studded Toulon team was absolutely ridiculous. Um, I was up against Ali Williams and Backy's both, both are, um, but yeah, I met, we 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 had a, we, I think we played re- played really well, and the game went to. I think we had chances to win it. I think Jimmy just missed a, a penalty or a drop goal. I remember there was another instance where something happened, and it was it was the worst possible bounce of the ball for Jimmy. And if it had gone in, like it could have gone like anywhere, but it went the worst place it possibly could have, and Jimmy would have scored. Um, but anyway, it went to extra time, and we still believed we could win it because you know they're big, they're heavy, and we thought the longer it goes on, the, it, it'd play into our hands. Um, but yeah, we were. I think we were going pretty well, and. Um, yeah, there's uh, Habana got an interception. Um, I think Mads uh, in Malagan threw a kind of a, a miss pass, and Habana, one of his biggest strengths, read it, um, caught the ball, and uh, that was it. That was game over. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, enough. if we'd won that, I fully believe we would have won the final. But here, yeah, look, that's, uh, that's been and gone. So, unfortunately for me, that was uh, one of the games that made me cry. Still had a, you know, obviously a, a very successful time at Leinster, and I'm, I'm sure you look back with great memories. And then the time comes to to move on, and, and you look to go to France, and uh, ultimately that that doesn't really happen. So, so, so what kind of happened there? Yeah, I just sort of, I'd always, I'd always wanted to have a have a couple of years in France. Um, I just it just kind of really excited me and I thought that would be a good way to finish off if I could by doing that. Um, Lens would offer me another a one year extension, but uh, I was trying to get to the top 14, but I could only get a one year. Um, but then Narbonne came, came offered a, a two year um, and, you know, I was 35 at that stage and I was just thinking, you know, try and mil- play for as long as I can, milk as long as I can. And um, so signed the two year at Narbonne, I'd, I'd I'd found a place to live, um, and, and everything, and um, yeah, then unfortunately got injured uh, training, um, and got advised to retire. So uh, it, 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 all of a sudden, uh, the house came tumbling down very quickly because you know I've been very lucky in my career. I haven't had too many 
bad injuries. Um, and then, yeah, just uh, it's kind of, yeah, it just happened very quickly that I can take up that move to France and uh, had to hang up the boots, which was a, a shame for me because, you know, at that stage, I was thinking I'd be I'd be playing till I was 38, 39, 40, maybe even. Yeah, and it, it must be tough just having that, you know, almost your, everything just taken away from you in that sort of split second. And that conversation must have been really tough with the doctors and the medical team to ultimately advise you to hang up your your boots that must have been really tough then adapting into sort of the real world um after that and is that sort of one of the reasons why that you you're sort of so um so involved with the rpa and helping lads out at newcastle currently and at sale as well yeah no no doubt it was a it was a shock but you know i look back now and I, you know i was 35 and I think to myself, you know, a lot of lads don't get a chance to play till they're 35 and I think there'll be less and less players um, playing till they're 35. So yeah. I have to look back and be happy. At the time, I was gutted. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of guys don't make it to past 30. So look, I can't be too sad about that. But um, yeah, no, I uh, after I finished, it was a bit of a, yeah, it was certainly a shock to the system. I really didn't enjoy my first year. I was, uh, I really missed being a professional rugby player is kind of a, I think it happens to every player really, no matter what you've achieved in the game, it's a bit of a loss of identity. You kind of, you've been a, I've been a professional rugby player for 17, 17 years since 2000. Then yeah. all of a sudden I'm not a rugby player and I'm trying to find, you're trying to work out, oh, what, so what am I now? Uh, who, who am I? How do I add value? I went into a sales job um, in Ireland and, you know, it was a great company, great people, but it kind of made me realize that, Sitting at a desk nine to nine to five is not for me. I didn't enjoy it, um, but it was good because it, it taught me that that's not what I, what I want to do. Yeah. Um, we're about to have our our second baby, so um, the missus, my missus, who I met when I was playing at Newcastle, she she wanted to, always wanted to come back to Newcastle. So the kind of the timing was right, and I was thinking, you know, what what will I do? What shall I do? And I I was made aware of a role with the RPA. Um, and it was for development manager working with Newcastle Falcons and Sale Sharks. So for me, sticking to what I know, um, you know, I had thought about going into coaching as a defence coach, but, you know, ultimately I, it, it's like when you're a player, you've got to be prepared to up sticks and move around. So we just wanted to settle in Newcastle and uh, this role came up and, you know, it meant I was still going into the rugby environments, uh, working with players and, I, you know, I've really enjoyed it. Um, I, Pre pre lockdown, you know, the normal week for me is in uh, in sale for two days, Monday, Tuesday, and then in Newcastle Wednesday, Thursday. So, um, yeah, you, you watch to see the boys training a bit, and you kind of miss it, and still think you you can and you want to get out there. But um, yeah, I think as I'm getting older, I'm realizing um, the body's not up to it anyway. Yeah, and it, I mean, it must be such a rewarding job. I listened to I don't know if you've listened to the House of Podca- uh, House of Rugby podcast with Mark Jennings. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I've yeah, listened, so, yeah, I've listened, yeah. So he gave you a. I mean, he had an incredible story and a, obviously a very tough life. But he's he's given you a massive shout out um, for the work that you've done and the RPA have done. So it must be so rewarding to actually give back into rugby and you know help young lads um, along their journey and sort of life after rugby. Yeah, no, it's uh, the role's pretty diverse. I mean, it's just kind of being there and being available to the players uh, if they need any help with anything. Um, you know, it might be just you know sitting down with a player just to shoot the breeze and have a chat. Um, you know, it might. It's it's ultimately you know I, I say to the lads, I look back on my career and I think how much more I should have done, could have done, and wish I had done. And um, so I'm just like without being pushy, uh, just trying to encourage them to to look, start thinking about you know, what's next after rugby. Um, and, you know, for a guy trying to find out what guys are interested in, uh, if they're looking to do a course, you know, go away, have a look at a few options for them, come back and discuss those options. So, you know, helping him, helping with, you know, uni references, personal statements, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I suppose, you know, if there's any other support the players need, it's kind of signposting them, signposting them or push, giving them a, a push in the right direction. Um, so yeah, no, it's nice to feel valued, and um, you know, it's it's nice to feel like you you're, you're helping. Hopefully, yeah. I mean, it's it's such a tough career. And we you know you, you see, and you'd have come across dozens of lads that were destined for big things, but a knee injury 
you know, a, a concussion, a back injury, and that's it. And it's it's ultimately just, you know, you're out in the real world and, you know, crack on on your own, really. And, um, you know, so obviously to be able to give backs, uh, absolutely massive. And, you know, any advice that players get, I'm sure they, they sort of value uh, very highly. Yeah, well, yeah, most of them do. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like, I, I uh, to be honest, I might... I was pretty useless when I was playing. I was just focused on my rugby, really. Um, and I didn't do too much outside of rugby. Um, and I kind of, I get it and I understand it. And I I think hopefully I can relate to the lads. You know, I played for 17 years, so I can relate to, you know, how they're feeling, what they're thinking and, uh, you know, what they're looking looking to do. So, um, yeah, just, yeah, that's all it is, really. Just been there to support them and help them if I can and if they need it. Good stuff. Uh, well, Mike, thanks for uh, chatting us through that. Very, very uh, interesting career. But it's time for everybody's favourite bit now, which is the Ultimate 15. So That's I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm keen to see who you go for. You can't put me on the spot. I'm going to have to go away and think about this, aren't I? <laughs> no, no, on the spot. Um, and our, our only rule is that you have to be in the team as well. It's the same with everybody. So, you have uh, to be. Yeah, so... Uh, you you not, you, no, uh, no, because you're not allowed to be. Because I said, wait there, you go give me a sec here to get one. I'm going to... Can I see Jamie's one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can I go you, to you, Jamie's you, one? If you just... Uh, if you it's head on Twitter, to your, is it? Yeah, it's on Twitter. And see who Jamie picked. Okay. Can you it's cut out this album. pause bit while I have a look? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, you can do that, can you? Okay. Uh, wait, wait, where's my thing on? Sorry, one sec, hold on. So I'll go to, I'll go to, yeah, I'm on it now. But Jay, you can't include yourself, can you? Uh, most of our players not, have. Jamie wouldn't I'm, because he was just too modest. Well, I'll put, can I put myself on the, no, no, I'm not including myself then. We'll, we'll put you as a social secretary. <laughs> yeah, put, put me as water boy. <laughs> is this, is this of all time? Falcons oh, of all time or just from like my, my, from my era? Uh, for, so, well, who, the, the best players you've played with, so... So sort of oh, doesn't it, doesn't it, oh, it doesn't have to be Newcastle. No, no, no. Just, oh, yeah, best that you played with. So uh, sort of Wasps, Leinster, Ireland. Oh, I see, right. Okay, okay. Well, hook on going Trevor Leota. That's a, um, that's a great shout, yeah. Uh, props would have to be... Um, props would have to be... Keen Healy and Tyg Furlong. That's ridiculous. It's probably the it's probably the hardest front row that's, <laughs> that there's ever been. Sec- second row, second row. Who would be second? Hey, lads, you can cut out the you can edit the wasted time, can you? Because I, I I don't want to rush it. I want to give it some thought. Is that all right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Second row, second row. Um, I wish you told me before. I'd have had a good thing. So it's got to be that you played with, not against. With, with yep. yeah. Yeah, with with okay, okay. Uh, second row. You've got to give it uh, to, to Paul O'Connell. Dev Tone. Dev Toner. Oh, Dev Toner. <laughs> um, yeah, Dev Toner. I didn't play. Oh yeah, I did play with. Uh, yeah, should I go? De- should I go? De- Who was? Oh yeah, Simon. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go. Paul. I'll go. Pauline Dev. Good man. Back row. Back row. I'll go. Uh, Delalio. Um, Delalio, I'll have Jamie Heaslip at six, Sean O'Brien at seven. That's a ridiculous set of forwards. <laughs> um, nine, I'll go Hall Charlton. Oh, interesting. Ten, how would you pick between Johnny and Sexto? This was the bit I really wanted to see. I wanted to see who you go with. Well, I'm an English Geordie, so I know who I'd pick. Can you not? Can you not do like? Can you not like go fifty? Can you not do half and half? Like because you could say one's might is carrying a bit of an injury, so one like can we do it that way? We'll do fifty-fifty for now, but I'm going to make you decide before this call is over. Okay. Um, okay. Where am I? I'm not very good with understanding backs, but uh, uh, where are we up to? So we've done t- nine. We've done ten. Um, two wingers, two centers, and a fullback. Uh, two wingers, two wingers, two centers, and a fullback. Sorry, I'm going to do uh, two wingers. Uh, Ethan Asiwa, uh, fullback, I think. 
Uh, what do I need? It's two centres. Ahead of Matt Burke. Do I need a centre? Yeah, two centres. Uh, I'll go um, Brian O'Driscoll. At shall I have him at thirteen or twelve? We'll stick him in at thirteen. And then who who, who okay. goes beside him at twelve? Who does twelve wasps? Who is it wasps? Who does the centres at wasps? Um, Mark Mayhoffler would have to be in there, maybe. He was class. Oh no, no, I'll go. I'll go. No, I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. Um, Nooney. He'll be. He, he 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 told me. He told me to. He said he asked me if I put him in. <laughs> so I don't let him. So yeah, should I go Nooney? Because because then Nooney can crash it up from twelve and get good gain line. Yeah, we'll go go Nooney at twelve. Um. So yeah, nine, ten. So I just need two wingers, do I? Two, two wingers, yep. Two wingers, two wingers. Uh, can you give me a couple more minutes? I'm trying to think who you play. Who, who were your wingers at, uh, at Leinster? Did you have? Well, Luke Fitzgerald. Well, he played on the wings sometimes. Um, I wish I'd played with that bloody, what's his name now? James Lowe. Oh, yeah. Um, he's he's uh, ridiculous. Wingers. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm really. Who was who's wingers? But who's wingers for Wasp back in the day? Uh, Paul Sampson or who's? Like did, any... did you have Josh Lucy? Did he play with? Yeah, he's fullback. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I'll leave him. Uh, Connor, who do you have as wingers and Connor? See, I'm, I'm terrible with the backs. I just can't picture. I can't. I don't really notice the backs. <laughs> um, uh, Too busy inspecting oh, the backs. Yeah, exactly. Lads, uh, wingers. I'm trying to think who you had. So, yeah, Tommy Bow, Tommy, Tommy Bow, one wing. Oh, that's a good shot. Yeah, Tommy Bow, one wing. And we need one more winger, don't we? One winger, yeah. Uh, I think we'll go Keith Earls. Keith Earls, why not? Great player, still is. Yeah. How's that sound, lads? That's quite a good team, That's isn't it? Some team, yeah. It, it, it's probably the best we've had so far. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm surprised you went. And you obviously Hall Charlton was a great player, but I'm surprised you picked him over uh, over some of your Leinster nines. Yeah. Well, I just I enjoy it. like. Well, look, I'll let you in for a little secret. Jackie is a good friend of mine, but I, <laughs> I he he's I think he should have achieved a lot more than he did he's he's one of the he's one of the toughest scrum halves I ever played with um, that was his game he was like he was like a back row forward um, very very brave and uh, yeah like I did enjoy playing with him so yeah I, I mean he, he was a great player from from what I can remember and do, do you think sort of partly was it a bit uh, you know uh, with like yourself at Connell uh, because of the club you're at do you think that sort of influence maybe his international career? Because he he was he was a fantastic play, player, and I think he played. I mean, he played could have been up to about two hundred games for the Falcons. Uh, consistently, very very solid at nine. Yeah, yeah, no, he was class. I, I I think I think didn't he? He benched an England game, I think once, and I don't I don't think he got on. Yeah, I think, maybe. yeah, he was. I know he was in and around uh, around sort of the same time that you at the Falcons. Yeah, yeah. I bet he's a man you'd want in the trenches with you anyway. Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. No, excellent. That's a, that's, that's a hell of a team. And as I say, I think, I think that's better than Berkey's and Nippy's team. So, so fair play to you. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, here, we'll, I'll just get grief now from people. that have, like that, That's the thing, isn't it? Well, you, you've you played for some excellent teams. Uh, obviously, you you played for Ireland in some layer peak years as well. So, it's always going to be tough to, to pick an ultimate 15. Actually, uh, Epi Tony would have been good in there, but um, Paddy, yeah, now it's fine. Well, Paddy Power. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, all right, lads. Um, no, that's not a bad much. team, is it? Thanks very much for the chat. We'll, we'll let Brilliant. you get away. Thanks um, very much, mate. Appreciate that. No, no. So that wraps things up for episode five. Thanks very much for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to the Northern Rugby Podcast channel, whether you follow us across Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Anchor, or YouTube. You can also follow us on Twitter as well and leave any questions or comments for our guests and we'll make sure they get answered. We'll see you guys next time for episode six. Bye for now.